Back in the days of the PS1, the N64 and Saturn, 3D fighting games were all a rage. You'd probably be surprised at just how many of them were released, especially seeing as the genre is only big enough for a handful of them nowadays. You've got the big ones of course, the Tekkens, Virtua Fighters, Dead or Alives, Smash Brothers and all of that, but there's a lot that just fell by the wayside, games that are quite close to being forgotten nowadays. And well, me being me, I thought it would be fun to have a look at them. I've got around 8 games in this video, concentrating on the PlayStation, there may well be Saturn and N64 ones later on, and we're not looking at the likes of Tekken or Soul Blade. We're not even really looking at cult games that may not have done well then but are highly thought of now, things like Rival Schools, Bushido Blade or Tobal or whatever. Nah, this vid's for the ones that scarcely get brought up at all, the ones you might not even recall until you're watching a gameplay compilation, a 100 obscure PS1 games in 10 minutes type thing, shoutouts to the Gary YouTube channel, and it crops up, triggering a memory. Not all of these games are good, indeed most of them aren't, but they show the genre's popularity during the 32-bit era. Let's go! If you're looking for a good time this June then come to Retcon, it'll be a grand day out at the Greenford Computer Club in West London on the 17th of June. There'll be lots of cool stuff to play, cool talks including people like the Oliver Twins, Kevin Toms and David Pleasance, and I'll certainly be there as well, having fun. Hope to see you there, details are in the description. In the early days of the PlayStation, 1995 or so, there were probably two fighting game series, 3D wise, that ruled the roost. Tekken is obviously one of them, and the other would be Battle Arena Toshinden. Not exactly as well thought of these days, but very popular in the PS1's first couple of years. But there is a third name that you could add to the mix. Have you all just forgotten about Zero Divide? Zoom's series of games, originally released in the summer of 95, did get good notices and sold quite well at the time, enough for there to be free Zero Divide games, and nowadays this series almost never gets mentioned, which actually is kind of a shame as there is some quite cool stuff to be found in the two Zero Divide games that came out on PlayStation. Zero Divide is a robot based fighter. You get 8 contraptions to choose from and you have to fight each other in order to take on Xtal, a strange database that threatens to release every single government's secrets if it isn't defeated. You've got the typical speedsters, hulks and all-rounders, although some might appear a bit more crab-like than others that have more human proportions. The fighting action is probably most similar to Sega's Virtua Fighter. It's definitely got that same sort of pace and timing about it, although there are some other cool extras, such as robots being able to hand off the edge of an arena and recover rather than just automatically eating a win out. This is definitely an early PS1 game and the graphics do kind of reflect that, but that said there are still some quite cool touches and the actual design of the robots is pretty neat. I mean. It sure as hell beats Rise of the Robots, doesn't it? Oh, and there's a very freaking cool easter egg. If you hold Start and Select with Controller 2 on Zoom's logo, you won't play Zero Divide. Instead, you'll play a miniature version of their earlier shoot-em up, Phalanx. You know, the one that's got the strange SNES cover with the old guy playing the banjo. It's actually a decent shmup and its inclusion here is unexpected but certainly welcome. The actual fighting game itself is perfectly acceptable. That said, the sequel, Zero Divide 2 The Secret Wish, that's considerably better. Released in 1997, the game features quite a few improvements. You get two new playable bots, a bunch more hidden characters and bosses, different arenas, and the game now runs at a lovely smooth 60 frames. This sequel only came out in Japan and Europe, and while the first title actually did shift a good few units, I imagine that this one was played by roughly a dozen people, which is a big shame. The fighting gameplay has been cleaned up quite nicely, it's still very much in the Virtua Fighter formula, and weirdly enough, seeing as it's based around robots, it's 
probably as close as you're going to get to a Virtua Fighter type experience on the PlayStation. I should mention that the music in both PS1 Zero Divide games absolutely slaps. Damn near every stage theme is really bloody good, classically high octane fighting type stuff. I enjoyed having a little look at this game and I would recommend you try it out for yourself if you're looking for something a bit different. And there is also a third Zero Divide game, however that one was exclusive to Japan and also exclusive to the Sega Saturn. It'll probably be covered if I do a Saturn video based on this theme. Sticking to the early days of the PS1, there was another 3D fighting game that tried to be a big name but, well, the game was a bloody stinker. Say hello to Criticom. This is a western game, released by a studio named Kronos Entertainment. Kronos were a young studio, initially tasked with creating assets for Sierra games like Phantasmagoria, before they went the way of 3D and made a deal with Vic Tokai to slap a fighting game up for the 1995 holidays. Criticom was the end result of a pretty intense six month development cycle undertaken by a young studio that didn't even have a PlayStation dev system at the time they agreed the deal, according to a 2001 Game Critics interview with CEO Stan Liu. However, they did end up delivering the game on budget and on time. Criticom has a pretty bloody nice load of FMVs, it has to be said. I mean, jeez, they're still pretty plush now, especially that intro. Said FMVs and stills in magazines were certainly enough to give it a decent amount of hype. But playing the game, especially now? Ooh, good lord. I would guess it plays closest to a 3D version of Mortal Kombat, but it might be fairer to say it plays like a 3D version of a Mortal Kombat ripoff, Kasumi Ninja or something like that. It's quite unrelentingly sluggish, and the animation is just all over the shop, really. Not pleasant even by early PS1 standards. The game also has a Killer Instinct-esque system where you get two energy bars as opposed to having rounds, although falling off the arena is an automatic loss. If anything, this makes wrestling with the CPU even harder. Honestly, I tried, but I couldn't even get past the first fight. Some things about the game are just completely out there. You have this levelling system where every fighter starts at level 1, I wonder if that's why, in one fight, I virtually dominated Yenji with Gorm, and yet every attack I did seemed to do virtually zero damage, meaning I still ended up losing at time over. This is quite annoying, to say the least. Apparently, you have to beat all the fighters three times over in order to max out your player, unlock all your moves, and then fight the Emperor in order to actually complete the game, which, <laughs> well, good grief. Reviews of the game were mixed, to say the least. However, Criticom didn't actually sell too badly, helped by it being an early game. There weren't too many other 3D fighters around at the time. It is really awful to play now, and absolutely needed more time in development, but the studio had six months, and that was that. Stan Leo did candidly admit afterwards in 2001 that Criticom perhaps wasn't the best of games. <laughs> We're sticking with Kronos for our next entry. There were initial plans for a sequel to Criticom that would have been on Sega Saturn, but this sequel was eventually rolled into their next fighting game, 1997's Dark Rift. This game actually ended up being exclusive to the N64, but Kronos would return to the PlayStation for their third fighter, 1998's Cardinal Sin. Later on, reviewer Brad Galloway would refer to these three games as the Trilogy of Terror. And yet, he's not far on. Now I do have strong memories of Cardinal Sin, seeing as it came on one of the official mags demo discs, and it is definitely the best of these three games, but... Yeah, it's still not what I would call any good, really. This is a weapons-based fighter with a fantasy setting, and it does have a couple of neat tricks compared to Kronos' other two titles. Cardinal Sin is a free-roaming fighting game, allowing you to go wherever you want in the various arenas. 
This does come in handy as there are quite a lot of power-ups scattered around, ranging from energy boosts to increased strength and so on. The arenas are really the best part. Some of them feature the odd trap which can keep you on your toes. The fight in itself? Yeah, that's where things get a bit more mundane. Kronos' animation has certainly improved since the days of Criticom, but it still lacks that certain oomph. It's one of those western type PS1 games that might not look too bad, but some other elements like the music and effects and just the general impact of things don't have as much put into them. And on the whole, well, you would never choose to play this over something like Soul Blade. I still have a little soft spot for Cardinal Sin, purely based on nostalgia for the demo, but yeah, it's not a good game. Kronos Entertainment did, however, go on to make the much more critically acclaimed and successful Fear Effect 1 and 2, so it's not all bad for them as far as the PlayStation goes. Unfortunately, the cancellation of the third Fear Effect game proved fatal for the studio, and they disbanded in 2002. <laughs> Sticking with weaponry, let's move to a slightly more distinguished name in the fighting game genre. Capcom. Capcom certainly did a few 3D fighters in this time. You've got rival schools, of course, which is a classic. There's the Street Fighter EX games, which some people like but don't really work for me. And of course, there's the almighty Final Fight Revenge. Yeah, this game's bloody ridiculous, but I do have quite a soft spot for it, even if it is bad. Before any of those games, however, there was Star Gladiator from 1996, the company's first 3D fighting game, and one that doesn't really get mentioned a whole lot today. Shame really, as it's quite cool. A sci-fi themed game where humans, androids and aliens duke it out for galactic supremacy. Or something like that anyway. Capcom's first 3D fighter isn't actually all that simplistic. There's a fairly detailed system when it comes to getting the most out of the game, and it doesn't exactly control like your typical Street Fighter. Star Gladiator is all about the plasma system. You'll want to spend some time in the training beforehand, studying the matrix of combos that each character has. Five stringed attacks will result in a final strike that can break through a guard, and the system also includes counters and super moves. It seems a bit daunting, but it is actually quite well presented when you have a little practice. The fighting is very good. You get quite a range of characters that pose different problems, from Gore and his magic to Selkin, a bird-like alien who just flies around everywhere. It's not a smooth game, but it still feels good to play. The moves do have a lot of impact, and while it's not quite at Soul Blade level, it's certainly in the next best league. It looks really nice too. Although it does look a bit familiar, doesn't it? All of these glowing weapons, a operatic sci-fi theme? Yeah, Star Gladiator is pretty heftily influenced by Star Wars. According to Seth Killian, a former Capcom community manager who was interviewed by Destructoid years ago, the game actually was originally designed as a Star Wars based fighting game, although this only appears to have ever been on paper. Still, the homage to George Lucas's series was definitely noted in reviews of the time. Now, there is of course an official Star Wars fighting game out there for the PS1. <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, Star Gladiator is roughly 2,000 times better than that pile of done. <laughs> Of course, when I speak of the official Star Wars fighting game, I am referring to Masters of Tuas Kasi. There are many weird licensed Star Wars games out there, and this is one of the worst. An absolute stinker of a fighting game, one that often gets brought up so that it can be rightly mocked the hell out of. It is awful, although it's certainly good just for a laugh. However, if you fancy another fighter based on a licensed property that's also quite ridiculous, and actually a bit more palatable as a game, well, have you ever played Warpath Jurassic Park? 
Released in 1999 and developed by Black Ops Entertainment, Warpath allows you to recreate the time when dinosaurs ruled the Earth by pitting them against each other in one-on-one -on -one combat. So if you thought that Primal Rage was the only dino-based fighting game in town, turns out you were dead wrong. You get eight dinosaurs to play around with in Warpath. The T-Rex and Velociraptor are obviously here, but you also get the likes of the Ankylosaurus and Styracosaurus, as well as a few unlockables including the Triceratops and Albertosaurus. It's kind of silly from the start as the dinos all have to have their proportions changed to vaguely match each other. So the T-Rex is actually pretty bloody tiny here, only slightly larger than the Raptor, who is now massive. As our Mesozoic Maulers clash, humans or animals will run around the arena like idiots. These can be gobbled up for a health boost, although really it is kind of a laugh to have a dog chasing the dinosaurs around and woofing all over the place, so they may as well just be left alone. The game is definitely rough around the edges, but the actual fighting is fine. You get a lot of impact with the blows and honestly it's just amusing to see how things like combos and throws get shoved in when the characters here are freaking dinosaurs. The game looks like a total laugh and really, yeah it's quite fun to play. Hardly a great fighter in the slightest but it's so stupid that you can't help but have a giggle. Now this must go down as one of the most obscure Jurassic Park times of them all. It may well have sold better than something like Trespasser at the time, but more people surely know that game nowadays. You're not exactly hard up for choices when it comes to stupid fighting games though, certainly not in the 32-bit years. And for various reasons, Evil Zone is usually the first that springs to mind for me. Developed by Yux in 1999 and released in the West by the almighty Titus, Evil Zone is a very different sort of 3D fighter, one that's more based on projectiles and long-range attacks rather than getting up close and personal. In fact, you only get two buttons in Evil Zone, one for attack and one for guard. It's a real credit to the developers that despite only having two buttons to play with, they still managed to make the game's fighting system thoroughly incomprehensible and random. It's all about charging up big attacks and then launching them in the direction of your opponent's face, but it's confusing as hell. Even the movement's weird and actual attacks just seem to happen regardless of what you do. Evil Zone presents itself like an anime. You get an absolutely snazzy as hell opening vid that was outsourced to AIC, a proper animation company, and each fight in the story mode is presented like an episode of a serial, complete with an introduction and pre and post match dialogue between the two fighters. The cast of characters is frankly magnificent. There's the likes of Gully Vanish Gregman, a bounty hunter, Kaya, a business suit wearing magician. Danzavar, a robotic inspector, and lots of other weird and actually quite good looking creations. It helps that the voice talent includes freaking Paul Iden and John St. John, and all involved ham it up gloriously. So, you know, if you've ever wanted to hear Colonel Roy Campbell grunt, war and scream things like, don't run away, during a fight, this is your game. It's kind of annoying that all of this hilarious and excellent presentation is in service of a game that is just so balked play-wise, really. So yeah, you shouldn't play Evil Zone. However, you definitely should go to the old Retza Prey channel, where you can watch Slow Beef and Diabetes riffing on the Galley and Kaya playthroughs. <laughs> That's bloody hilarious. You? Where are you? Yeah. We move on to a big studio that you would think would have a bit more of a presence in the world of fighting games, that being Konami. Konami and fighting games is an odd subject. In 1984, they created one of the most groundbreaking games in the whole genre, that being the immensely influential Yaya Kung Fu. And while the couple of other fighters they've made have got some slight notices, 
that was the only time they've ever really done anything impactful in the genre. When SF2 hit, Konami were reduced to making total flop clones of Capcom's game, like Martial Champion. Other 2D and 3D fighting games by Konami mostly barely made any impact. They haven't released any kind of fighting game since 2008's terribly received Castlevania Judgment, and really it's probably better that way. I mean, I guess you could say that they published Bloody War too, but really that's a Hudson Soft game. So yeah, Konami just suck at fighting games, and they largely always have. Or rather, they couldn't make a hit fighting game to save their life. It's one of those odd little fins. Which brings us to Kensei Sacred Fist, a PS1 game from late 1998. I think you would only need to know the title of the game to correctly guess at how unoriginal this game might be. This is Konami um, paying homage to Tekken, to put it in the kindest possible terms. I mean, geez, even the menu and character select screens scream out Tekken, as do the characters, the fighting style and everything else. There is perhaps one big difference. Characters can't really jump in Kensei, so there's much more of an emphasis on sidestepping and dodging. There's also other little things like the ability to grapple on the ground, or to grab opponent's strikes and reverse them with a strike or throw. These are cool things, although they can also be found in better games like Tekken 3 or Dead or Alive. All that said, is this a bad game? Mm, no, not really. It may be as blatant a Tekken ripoff as it gets, but it's quite well executed, the combat's got a fair bit of depth to it, and the characters have a nice range of styles. Still, the unoriginality of the game meant that it got absolutely starched in reviews, and compared to the likes of Tekken 3, yeah, Kensei never stood a chance. Needless to say, there was no Kensei 2. Still, eh, not awful, even if you would obviously have more fun just playing Tekken. Right, there's one more game. Now, I don't claim for this vid to be exhaustive. There's a few games that I've not mentioned. I've stuck to those that had Western localizations, and the line between what's forgotten and what isn't is always going to be a bit arbitrary. Still, this final game is certainly a very weird one, although eh, it's not very good at all. The last game here is Killing Zone, a 1996 title released by Naxat and Acclaim. This was developer Scarab's sequel to a Sega Saturn exclusive title they made called Battle Monsters, a game that used digitised sprites as opposed to 3D models, and other fighters in their library include their debut game, Survival Arts from the Arcade. Those who've played Battle Monsters largely really enjoy it for its speed, creativity and freakishness. I mean, it's even got platforms in it. You get to pit classic horror movies against each other, and Killing Zone is basically the 3D version of that. However, the concept doesn't come across nearly as well in the third dimension. Luostra at least is very cool. <laughs> You've got all sorts. A classic Frankenstein's monster with the screws in his head and everything, a man who can turn into a werewolf, a mummy with go-go gadget limbs, a Ray Harryhausen-esque skeleton who'll leave you in bits, all the classics. The characters are nice, but fighting with them? Oh, sheesh. The moves really do leave something to be desired, it has to be said. The quality of the animation is really low, and this and the graphics does make the game feel very cheapo indeed. Compared to what you get in Battle Monsters, this does feel so much more generic, more like a half assed take on Virtua Fighter that doesn't do these characters justice. It seems as though Scarab had some plans for the game that they weren't able to implement, such as allowing for limbs to be ripped off, but this didn't materialise, presumably due to time and budget. There is one quite odd touch, an auto mode where you don't actually play as a beast, but instead you coach them through tournaments, using attack and advance commands during fights and um, not really knowing what the hell those mean. It's kind of like the old Mega Drive game Beast Wrestler, I guess. Now I realise that comparing a game to Beast Wrestler is not exactly the highest of compliments, but I can't think of many other fighting games with such a mode. But even then there's not a whole lot of depth to it. 
It's a shame really, the concept is cool and Battle Monsters is a good example of it working, but in Killing Zone it just doesn't make the transition to 3D. At all. And well, that's about it. There may well be similar videos to come for the N64 and the Saturn, after all there's definitely some unique little fighting games to be found on both of those systems that have just about been totally forgotten nowadays, particularly when it comes to the realm of 3D. Hopefully you've enjoyed this one and if you happen to have played any of these titles, I hope that covering them has jogged your memory, whether that's good or bad. Of course it's up to you if you want to actually revisit any of them. But until the next time, bye for now.